It's a great pleasure for me to introduce my friend Susan Kaplan. Um, Susan is the director of the Perry Macmillan Arctic Museum and Arctic Studies Center at Bowdoin College in Maine, uh, where she's a professor of anthropology. And her research overlaps a number of disciplines, history, archaeology, and anthropology. And uh, she, her big contributions uh, and that she continues to make um, are mostly focused on our understanding of Inuit history and prehistory, particularly in Labrador, but elsewhere in the Eastern Arctic. The focus of her archaeology is really broad. Uh, she is very interested in the relationship between cultures and people's responses to their physical environment. So, but at the same time, she has this way of focusing in really particularly on specific research questions. So her research on the Inuit use of wood, for instance, uh, the resources, um, she looks at that as quite unexpected and enlightening because she discovered uh, what a dramatic impact they had on the Labrador coastal environment. Uh, she's written on Inuit art, again, sort of broadly, but uh, she's focused sharply, for instance, on these interesting and unusual drawings made by children in Nain, which uh, is the subject of a paper she wrote that's fantastic. Uh, her historical research has looked at the use of science and technology and the impact made by Arctic exploration in the mid-19th uh, and early 20th century society. And um, while many of us are aware of Robert Perry's expeditions, today, once again, Susan is going to bring this, her, her magnifying glass, in on a particular topic and give us some of the untold stories that uh, are going to be really interesting to find out about an otherwise pretty well-known topic. So, thanks. Thank you. So I'd like to first um, thank Patty and all of those of you who um, helped get me here. It's been a while since I was in Calgary, and it's a really treat, a treat um, to leave icy Maine for foggy, snowy Calgary. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to do is take you on a, 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 a fast and, and wild ride um, to um, um, that focuses on Peary's 1905-06 and 1908-09 North Pole expeditions. And the materials that I'm going to present, even though my name is up here, I need to acknowledge that this is the result of research that's been going on for about 20 years uh, that I have been involved in uh, with uh, Jenny Lemoyne, who is the curator of the Peary Macmillan Arctic Museum and got her PhD in archaeology here at Calgary, as well as many members of the Arctic Museum and Arctic Studies staff. So it's uh, sort of a full press effort to shed new light on um, these expeditions because they have turned very one-dimensional. There are huge arguments about whether Pe it was Peary or Cook or Henson or n none of them who got to the North Pole. Peary has been reduced to this one-dimensional character who um, was not user-friendly and was uh, desperate for uh, fame and um, when the concept of fear of failure was invoked, people said he never made it to the North Pole, and, uh, but he sort of uh, created the illusion. And so we realized that uh, most of this literature was focused on published accounts and of individuals reading one another's refutations or support of Peary's North Pole claim. And so what we did is we started to dive back into archives. Um, I tracked down the descendants of people who were crew members on his expeditions to see if they had materials that had never been published. We tracked down photographs. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to present to you today is, is some of the perspectives that we gained by ferreting out all this new information. Some of the photographs you'll see, such as this one, look like they're in color. All the photographs, except the modern ones, which are, you will see are maps, 
are historic photographs. They were taken in uh, black and white, uh, sometimes nitrate, sometimes uh, a safety film. And the color is because these are hand tinted glass lantern slides. Um, so you have the illusion that it's a color photograph, but it was hand tinted after the fact. So on April 6, 1909, Robert Peary, his African American assistant, Matthew Henson, and four Inuit. Now I use the term Inuit, these are Inuit from Northwest Greenland, and they have their own dialect of Inuktun, and so we refer to them as they refer to themselves, as Inuit. In the historic literature, they're sometimes referred to as the polar Eskimos or the Arctic Highlanders. And this, these are um, uh, Siglu, Uta, Ukia, and Egingwa. And so these six men stood at the North Pole. Now it was, um, for Peary and Henson, it was the culmination of years and years of work. And for the Inuit, it was a really unsettling, very dangerous voyage um, whose purpose they didn't really understand. And this is a photograph of the camp um, at the North Pole. Whether it was actually at the North Pole, as I said, has been debated. The Navigation Foundation, analyzing shadows of photographs, has concluded that they were within five uh, miles of the North Pole, which I think 1908-09 is good enough for me. Um, so I just put Calgary here on the map so you get a sense, and I'm going to be focusing most of my talk um, here, and um, just to orient you, the Inuit are here. Uh, the community of Kanak was a community that Peary uh, did a lot of his work out of. And then we'll move across uh, to a site right south of Alert, um, which is where Peary uh, froze his ship in, in both, both times for um, over the winter. Oops. So who was Robert Peary? He was a Bowdoin grad, had a degree in civil engineering, and looking through his school records, it's very clear that even back then he was a really inventive problem solver. He also did have, he really had ambition. He wanted to be famous. He was raised by a, a single mother who followed him to college and doted on him. Um, but he financed his way through Bowdoin by doing taxidermy. Um, early on, um, he went to uh, Nicaragua. Um, he took a man, Matthew Henson, with him who uh, was his valet. Uh, in Nicaragua, and they were basically um, surveying for a canal, but the Panama Canal was built instead. And then Peary set his sights on Greenland, on investigating Greenland, and he wanted to be the first person to cross the Greenland ice cap, but Nansen beat him to it. So he was focusing on Greenland, and he was having trouble, he had gone on two expeditions and he was having trouble raising money. And he went and he gave a lecture and he had a few photographs and he realized how much money he could raise lecturing and that these photographs were very evocative and he could do a lot with them. And so this is his first posed photograph. He became a really excellent uh, PR guy. Um, and what you see is he's seated on um, his, um, his equipment on this uh, ridiculous uh, little toboggan, which he manholed um, in Greenland. Um, he uh, has on skis and he has on traditional Inuit clothing. And I want you to reflect back on this image near the end of the talk. So um, I have a heavy finger here. Um, 
He married Josephine Peary, and she was integral to his expeditions. Uh, she scandalized Victorian society by actually going to the Arctic with him. And in fact, she had the audacity to go pregnant and take a midwife and have a child in the Arctic, figuring if Inuit women did it, why not? Josephine, um, and Marie, also known as the Snow Baby, was born um, up there. She was also a major fundraiser for him. And um, so as his fame grew, as his expeditions uh, mounted in size, he did things like bring back huge meteorites that are now sitting at the museum uh, of uh, natural history in New York. Um, he became quite famous, and when he decided he wanted to get to the North Pole, um, he had a ship built and um, very strategically named it after the President of the United States, and here he is shaking Roosevelt's hand. So very calculating, very smart man. Peary was obsessed with sledges. As we went through his papers, there are drawings of sledges everywhere. Um, he experimented with them. Um, this is a linen drawing of a toboggan that he used, also again man hauling in Greenland where the, um, where the ice was and snow was pretty smooth. Um, but there were times when he had seven different sledge designs on the go, and he kept track of them. Um, he experimented with different woods. Some sledges were uh, pegged, some had pegging and lashing, some were high, had high seats, some low. He calculated the fr friction of the sled runners. I mean, he was an engineer. And so he was studying these sledges. When a sledge broke, he documented where it broke, why it broke, what it was carrying, what was going on. So he's doing this great study throughout his career of these sledges. And he's not satisfied with any of them because at that point, he was moving out onto the Arctic sea ice. And it was very uneven, and these sledges were just getting broken to pieces. And so then he looked at the Inuguit sledge, and this is a drawing that Ross made when he encountered the Inuguit of an Inuguit sledge. Well, the Inuguit did not have wood, and so their sledges were like two or three feet long, and they were lashed together from anything that um, um, the Highlanders could use to make a sledge. But he realized everything was lashed together and that a sledge that was lashed together had flexibility. It could torque. It wasn't going to break. And so he experimented, and he ended up um, increasing the length of the sledge. This is a 16, 15 to 16 foot sledge made out of oak, but is based on the Inuit design. It is at Bowdoin. It is one of the five sledges that made it to the North Pole and it's lashed together. He calculated how much weight it could carry and realized that it could carry more weight than men could handle. Um, and so he was also very particular about how it was, um, how equipment was packed on it, the weight of the equipment. Um, and of course, by this point, he's using the Inuit technique of dog teams in fan shape. Uh, formation. Matthew Henson and the Inuit made all the sledges. And these sledges proved to be wonderful. Uh, there were times they'd be going down passes and they'd lose control of the sledge. Sometimes they'd bash to pieces and they'd have to cannibalize other sledges, but they really uh, performed admirably. Uh, you can see the uneven um, terrain that they had to basically uh, drag, or sometimes they took axes and hacked their way through the ice and, and pulled the sledges along. You can see how high the pressure ridges got. 
And there is also bare ground that um, they were traversing. At this point, they're coming back from Fort Conger, and the Inuit there is wearing a hat that he recovered from Fort Conger. And then there were also small sledges that he built. And here is an Inuit hot rodding uh, some supplies back to the Roosevelt after some task. Here is the Hubbard sledge, the sledge I told you about that's at Bowdoin. Um, it, there it is set up on the Roosevelt on their way back from the North Pole. And you can see, even though it was lashed together, you can see all the repairs. These sledges had a very, very hard life. It now sits in a beautiful climate-controlled case. As much as he was obsessed with, stove, with, with sledges, he was even more obsessed with stoves. Every draft of a letter or a list contains doodles, Peary designing stoves. He understood that he had to keep his men hydrated. He understood that crossing the sea ice, they were going to have to stop and they were going to need hot tea. And so, uh, but he was also concerned about weight um, he wanted his stoves to be lightweight. He wanted them to use as little fuel as possible. And so again, he was experimenting. And here are some, sorry about this. Um, here are some examples of some of the doodles that um, he was doing. Um, Donald McMillan, um, in 1908-09, uh, joined Peary's expedition, and he's written a book called How Peary Reached the Pole. And in that book, he describes being summoned to Peary's ho um, hotel room in New York City um, because he's going to be buying supplies for the expedition. The entire back wall of the hotel room has stoves in it that have been ordered from all over the world. And Peary has product tested them all. He's not happy with any of them. He comes up with a design which he has his men uh, build. It turned, it burnt alcohol. It turned ice to boiling water in seven minutes and extinguished itself in nine. And um, the men on the expedition talked about the fact that when they stopped, their hands were cold, and they would you know, tr try and put their hands around the stove, and all too fast, it went out. But they had hot beverages. And here is, I'm going to see if I can switch to this one. Here um, are Inuit and that box. Um, he also designed uh, to carry the stove, and he specified exactly where on the sledge that stove was to be carried so that very efficiently, when the men stopped for a tea break, uh, all the necessary supplies were there, and no one had to unpack any other part of the stove. Here is the stove in use. Um, in addition to acknowledging uh, the sledge, Peary realized that Inuit technologies and techniques of travel were, in many cases, far superior from the, of those of the West. He abandoned the use of uh, sleeping bags. Um, his men worked so hard on the trail that he actually had the Inuit women make sheepskin coats for them, and then uh, when they stopped for the evening, they'd put on their uh, Inuit fur garments to keep warm. Um, they'd sleep in igloos that the Inuit would build for them. And here is Matthew Henson dressed in um, Inuit uh, attire, polar bearskin pants still used very regularly in those communities. And this clothing, 
was made by women. This is a photograph of women working on the deck of the Roosevelt, making the clothing for all of the Western men. Western science was very important to Peary. Um, his crew did tidal readings. Um, he also set up stations. Here's uh, uh, Ross Marvin in front of one of the stations at Cape Sheridan, where you can see thermometer outdoors. Um, and they were recording sometimes three, four times a day uh, what the environmental conditions were. We also have found records of him railing against instrument makers because the, the instruments are not accurate enough. So, and he was always tinkering with things, constantly tinkering with things. And here's one of those thermometers that's in the Arctic Museum collection. So, he's doing all of that, but he needs a vessel that is going to get him as far north as possible. He did not want to waste his time sledging over land. However, what he was going to have to do is get a vessel through this narrow Lincoln Robeson channel. And the vessels, except for the Fram, that were available were vessels that avoided the ice. They did not engage the ice. And here is a satellite photograph of the ice that goes through that channel. And Peary had the audacity to imagine that he was going to build, design and build a vessel that would negotiate this, and he did. It was the SS Roosevelt that I mentioned to you. Um, he built it with Winnant, um, a naval architect. Um, it had so much bracing, it had three times the amount of wood of a conventional vessel. He chose as his captain, Robert Bartlett, who was 32, 34 year old at, year old at the time, uh, from a long line of very experienced ice captains from Newfoundland. And he chose George Wardwell, an engineer, um, um, on, to be on both expeditions. And it's because of this man's journal that we know a lot of what happened on this expedition. Um, Peary devotes one line to Wardwell, saying that he was unflappable. Um, but he owes a tremendous amount to Wardwell. So Wardwell kept journals on both expeditions, which is very unusual for a chief engineer. And he never failed to enter an account in his journal. I've looked at a lot of journals, and sometimes there are gaps that people then go and try and fill in, and they don't quite do it. And you do not see gaps in this journal. Um, he's telling you everything that's going on. He doesn't really care about the North Pole. He just cares about doing his job. And so he's just very frank about everything that he sees. So, in 1905-06, the ship is on its maiden voyage. It's left Portland, Maine. Um, and as they start going, uh, the boilers put in, in in Portland, but there's been no sort of maiden voyage to see if everything works because they've got to get north. The boilers start malfunctioning and erupting. And they become, they, they acquire nicknames of Pili and Vesuvius after the volcanoes. And one is always in disrepair, and poor Mr. Wardwell is having to constantly repair them. In addition, the boilers are so hot and the bracing is so extensive that the boilers start fires and the beams of the ship are, there are constantly fires going on and the men are having to cut away bracing as they move north. Um, uh, so this doesn't sound like any kind of uh, picnic. Um, however, they proceed north, things calm down, except that the boilers uh, keep malfunctioning through the entire voyage. 
Um, and there is also a point where the vessel encounters ice and what the Roosevelt was designed, it's the forerunner of the icebreaker, it was designed to ride up on the ice and then crash it down. It had an auxiliary boiler system that would kick in when they really hit hard ice. But there was a point when there was a standstill. So Bartlett and Peary get out on the ice and they start setting as, well, they start setting dynamite charges or as Bartlett says in his writings, we put to use Mr. DuPont. So they're having a great time blowing up the ice. It's very clear. But poor Mr. Wardwell's in the ship, and the ship's shaking more and more. So he describes going out uh, on, um, and getting out onto the ice and telling these two guys that they're setting their dynamite charges too close to the ship. And they're having a gay, wonderful time. They go, oh, you worry, Wart, go back to the engine room. Fifteen minutes later, the entire ship shudders. The boilers break th their fastenings. All the pipe fittings crack, and the Roosevelt starts leaking. And from then on, the Roosevelt, this brand new ship, has to have three bilge pumps running. Um, and then poor Mr. Wardwell has to reconstruct everything. So they go and they pick Inuit and um, in 1908-09, 100, I think, 93 dogs and um, 24 Inuit men with their families. And, they, and here it is a smelly, noisy uh, ship because they also have whale meat that they've picked up that is going rancid. So between the dogs and the whale meat, a very, very noisy and smelly affair. Um, but they get, um, both years, they get to Cape Sheridan. Now Cape Sheridan, uh, which is where the alert um, was in the 1800s, is not, you, is not a really good sheltered area. And the ship is being protected by the fast ice that is around it, while pack ice keeps streaming uh, down the coast. And there is a refrain that Wardwell has in his journal that I didn't understand till I went to Cape Sheridan and then reread the journals. He, he, every morning, he's, he gets out and there's this refrain, I can hear the ice running, or the ice is not running today. And what I now realize is this seemingly unflappable man is worrying about the pack ice and whether the fast ice is going to keep the Roosevelt safe. And so that refrain is an expression of the stress that he is feeling because he stays with the ship both in 08, 09, and 05, 06. So he's with this ship for 15 months while other uh, Westerners are uh, traveling away from the ship to get to the North Pole. They have to cut ice away from the ship. They build a ramp to the ship. And there is a great deal of concern that the ship is going to be crushed in ice or there's going to be fires. So the Inuit immediately get off the ship and they establish base camps on shore. And Peary had planned for this. And so he specified that all of the food and equipment had to be uh, shipped to him in wooden containers of certain dimensions and that they opened from a specific end. And so what he did is he built crate houses. He took those crates, he built houses out of them, and you could go, you went into the house and you pulled whatever supplies you wanted out once you were inside the house. These were also work areas for building sledges and doing a lot of metal work. 
When you have suddenly over 100 people in a place you have to start hunting, Cape Sheridan, unlike areas further south like Fort Conger, was not, it's, it's a polar desert, very little game there, and what game was there, they very quickly depleted. And so people had to hunt, go further and further to hunt, and they had to rely a lot on the foods that were brought up, the tinned foods that were brought up. But life continued and Wardwell uh, recorded it. I don't think there is any mention of children in Peary's journals, and yet there are children at Cape Sheridan. Now, Peary had a system where many explorers up to this point, uh, during the winter nights, everyone would sit around and get out of shape. Well, Peary would have none of that. And what Peary did is he sent teams of Inuit and Westerners out together to do tidal readings. But first, the Westerners had to learn how to manage dog teams. And the way um, that um, Macmillan describes this happening is that they would take a number of dead dogs and they would put them out in formation, stand where they would stand if they were behind a sledge, and they would cover the dogs with some snow. Because what you really had to do is learn how to manage the whip. The whip was not to hit the dog, but to direct the dog. And so they were, they were um, working on their whip technique, and if they hit one of the dead dogs, you immediately knew it because a flurry of snow would come up. So uh, all of these teams are out, so they're in great shape once there is sufficient daylight, but it's still cold enough to start going over the Arctic Ocean towards the North Pole. And what Peary did is he had advanced teams with a lot of equipment cut, cut their way, cut the path to the North Pole, um, building igloos and leaving supplies along the way with the plan that he, Matthew Henson, fresh dogs and the most talented Inuit would use those trails so that they would expend no effort and he would be the, that would be the team that then went to the North Pole. So there are teams working. Now, uh, Borup and Macmillan, shown here with a gingwa, um, are farther north than many Western explorers got. He, Macmillan particularly mentions that they're farther north than Lockwood got. Um, and he comments in one of his publications that so many Westerners died trying to get to this point, but he was so well trained by Peary in the Peary system that he and Bartlett are having the time of their life. They can't realize, they can't believe that people lost their lives trying to get to where these guys are just enjoying another day. Matthew Henson turns out to have been a superb linguist. He became fluent in Inuktun. The Inuit looked at him and looked at the other Westerners and went, okay, he's not Inuit, but he sure isn't like these other Westerners. And so um, he had an easier time integrating into their culture. He had uh, two Inuit wives, one died and he married another uh, woman. Peary had an Inuit wife as well. They both had Inuit children. But Matthew Henson was beloved by the Inuit who called him Matthew the Kind One. But other Westerners we now know didn't fare so well. Um, here is Bob Bartlett with a group of Inuit. We have found out that Bob Bartlett, in fact, was a terrible dog sled driver. Um, but Ross Marvin lost his life. 
Now, Ross Marvin was coming back from his farthest north. He was uh, with Inuit. The Inuit end up getting to the Roosevelt in um, 1909 without Ross Marvin. The story they tell is that he left camp early and that they never saw him again, but they could see where he had fallen through the ice. A number of years later, they um, recount that, in fact, they killed him, that he was insisting that they go places and do things that they felt were endangering their lives, and they felt they had no alternative but to kill him. And some people consider this far-fetched, but what we found in the Wardwell journals was that in 1905-06, Fireman Clark, who was traveling with some Inuit, became so concerned because of tensions between him and his Inuit companions, he was sure that they were going to kill him. And he spent many nights um, afraid to fall asleep because he was sure he was going to lose his life. So this gives you a sense of, I mean, these men are out on the ice and the ice is moving. They're going to some weird destination. Tremendous anxiety anyway, and then collaboration from people who can't speak the same language and have completely different cultural norms just added to the stress. In 1905-06, the season was getting late, the, the ice was thinning, and Wardwell realized the ship was potentially going to get hit by pack ice. He got the ship moving, but the uh, winds shifted, and where he moved the ship to is exactly where the ice came, and it bashed the Roosevelt, destroyed her rudder, and with all the planning Peary had done, he had not, he didn't have a spare rudder. And so Bob Bartlett hacked up some more of the ship's interior, made a rudder, but uh, the Roosevelt then had a mind of her own, and the only way that Bob Bartlett could get her back to New York was by tacking with currents and the wind. Um, luckily, she was an auxiliary schooner, so she had sails, which they often had to rely on. And it took them six months to get back to New York, and once they were in New York, they collided with the Wall Street Ferry because they couldn't control the ship. But by 1908-09, all the problems were corrected and the ship uh, worked very well. So I've talked a lot from the perspective of the Westerners, but what was the impact of Peary's expeditions on the Inuit? Well, to answer that, since Inuit are not writing their history, there is oral history that uh, has been collected, um, but very little of it. Uh, Jenny Lemoyne and I um, convinced, to our amazement, the National Science Foundation to fly us, courtesy of those amazing pilots of Ken Borwick, uh, to Cape Sheridan. And what we, this is uh, Cape Sheridan, and these are barrel hoops from the alert. Um, and here are some of the tent rings left by the Inuit. While we were there, we saw one seal, or s we saw six, we had six sightings of seals, which is probably one seal seen six times, one muskox, some Arctic hare, a lot of bees, that was it. I mean, a real polar desert, but also not recovering from Peary's ex expedition's extensive impact on the land. Um, and so, and these um, archaeology sites are also now endangered with a sea level rise and, um, and the lack of protective ice. Um, 
But what was really surprising is that we found a midden in the middle of nowhere, but here, of cans. And we don't know how deep. These are all cans, fuel cans, food cans from um, the expedition. That's a photograph Wardwell took in 1905, so the, the can midden was already being created. And Jenny and I were very interested in that midden, which you can see is over here. Um, we also investigated, this is the remains of one of the crate houses. But what we started to do is examine the cans and we realized these cans were like um, archeologists in the room, they're cores that the Inuit were using to create uh, all kinds of containers. Um, but who were these Inuit? These were women. These are the women who are left behind when the men are sledging with Peary. And Josephine Peary is the first person to document Arctic hysteria, uh, also known as Pibloktok. This is a situation where m usually women, Inuit women, would uh, have some kind of fit, strip off their clothes and run outside. And they'd have to be restrained because they would freeze to death. Um, and uh, Wardwell has um, m descriptions of countless incidents of Pibloktuk. Lyle Dick has written about Pibloktuk, and whereas other people thought it was a season effect disorder or vitamin deficiency, he points out that it's the stresses that these women are, are feeling. There's no blubber, so they can't use their soapstone lamps. They're having to create lamps and burn kerosene in them. They don't have their foods. They're having to eat these tin foods. Um, they don't know when their husbands and sons are going to come back. And on top of that, they're being asked for sexual favors by crew of the Roosevelt. And so his theory, and I think it's a good one, is that Pibloktuk is a result of that. Um, you don't find manifestations of Pibloktuk later in history or in other Arctic communities. Try this one. So here are some of the cans, very deliberately cut, made into cups, rounded edges. Um, so why were these Inuit working with Peary? Why did they willingly go from Greenland to Ellesmere to a land that they did not know? Well, Peary was paying them, and he was paying them in precious Western goods. So here is a photograph, a very telling photograph, that has taken just after the expedition is over, and the Inuit women are being paid. Um, they're getting metal needles, they're getting fabric, they're getting pots and pans, all kinds of, they're, they're going home wealthy people. Um, but to me, it's also kind of telling that these women, almost all of them experienced Pibloktok, tremendous stresses, and you know, here's one of the sources of those stresses peeking into the photograph. And here are the Inuit men. Um, very wealthy, they all get multiple rifles, they get bullets, they get hardwood, they get uh, metals that they want. Here you can see that a lot of them are wearing t-shirts, cotton shirts. Um, and so they're going home rich, but in all likelihood, they all knew about the murder of Ross Marvin, and who knows how many times they themselves may have felt that they might need to murder one of these strange Westerners. So here then is a photograph 
which I think is um, a really interesting photograph. This is Battle Harbor. The 1908-09 expedition is over. Peary has come south. He hits Indian Harbor where there's a Marconi station, the northernmost Marconi station, and he telegraphs stars and stripes nailed to the pole, which is the code that he had set up to indicate that he had reached the North Pole. He then goes to Battle Harbor where there's another Marconi station and it's a, it's, it's a, a substantial uh, settlement and he's waiting for the press to come to him and they do. And so there are a series of posed photographs like this one uh, that are um, sent around the world. And what you see, what most Westerners would see is fearless Arctic explorers coming back from the pole, exotic attire, and uh, you know, a sledge used to get to the pole. But now that we know the backstory, we realize, first of all, there's some Peary ingenuity here in that the whole photograph is staged on the Roosevelt, which is this remarkable vessel, um, uh, that Matthew Henson, highly regarded by the Inuit and so respected by the, in, by the Western crew, the minute he hits the United States, he is nobody. He got no medals. He could not go to banquets because this was a time of the highest number of lynchings of African American men in US history. So away from the United States, he is highly respected. Back in the United States, he was nobody. Although when he went on a lecture circuit, um, people didn't know what to make of him because he was an American, had gotten to the pole, and they should be proud, but he was African American, and uh, they just could not accept this. So here he is, um, in, in a way, center in the photograph where he should be. But behind that, we now understand are the Inuit. The men, are dressed in Inuit clothing and very telling. Henson is wearing beautiful fox fur clothing made for him by his wife, far better quality than any of the other garments of the expedition. Um, and the ingenuity of travel and technology that the Inuit um, developed um, is behind this expedition, even though for so many decades uh, that knowledge and those contributions have not been acknowledged. Today, you can go to the North Pole on a Russian nuclear icebreaker. You can helicopter there, have champagne, and be in your warm bed back in Svalbard. Um, Today, you can't go, you can't replicate Peary's trip uh, because the ice conditions do no, no longer exist. If you tried this, you better take some kayaks or canoes with you. And ironically, in a way, so with climate, things changed, culturally things changed, but in a way, things have also stayed the same. So the race to get to the North Pole back in the 1900s was certainly because of bragging rights that nations wanted, nationalism, but also because there was a lot of uh, speculation that there were land here with all kinds of resources and there were pamphlets uh, speculating as a way to raise money for expeditions about the coal and the minerals that would be on these lands. We now know there were no lands, but what do we have today but a race to claim uh, parts of the Arctic Ocean in order to exploit the resources below the seafloor. <laughs>
So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take questions. I think he came pretty close. Um, whether he actually made it, I don't know. You have to realize the accuracy of his instruments, plus the fact that he's heading towards the pole, and the ice that he's on is not only moving south, but it's, it's, it's moving east. And so navigation was, in fact, very difficult. And we will never know. The Navigation Foundation, as I said, went through and, and did their, um, a bunch of admirals, who, members of the Navigation Foundation, used their spy technology to analyze the shadows on photographs where they knew the day and the time when a photograph was taken. And they concluded five miles. So whether it was further than that, I don't know. The point is that there was no way to, to corroborate. And in fact, it wasn't till uh, Playstead, who was a dentist, uh, snowmobiled to the North Pole. That's the first instance in which there was independent verification of someone reaching the North Pole because there was a flight over him to verify his position. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so they're taking sightings, and they've got artificial horizons. But the real issue is that, you know, you, there are calculations, but you could sit in Calgary and take a worn piece of paper and write these calculations get a little weather beaten, and claim you were at the North Pole. And um, one of the um, arguments is that Peary kept a little notebook. And the piece of paper where he's written all his calculations and claims that he's at the North Pole has been ripped out. It's a, 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 a single leaf of paper that's then stuck into that notebook. And oh my goodness, the number of pages that have been written about the authenticity of that piece of paper is phenomenal. We borrowed it for an exhibit. It's about this big. And we had to have an armed guard stationed 24 hours a day next to it. But I can tell you that there are people today who are as passionate for and against Peary and Cook, who was his rival today, as there were over 100 years ago. It's an argument that is alive and well. And my position is we're never going to know. And in fact, it's not a really interesting question. There's a lot of other things on that expedition much more interesting. How, how, how long was the Roosevelt ship? Um, she was, I'm trying to remember. I have to get back to you on her exact dimensions. Yeah. Yes? What kind of scenery did the last ship? Um, well, the, the, on the sledges, it's a walrus hide. What they would do, what the Inuit would do, was basically um, to, um, you know how people peel an, uh, an orange? Yeah. Well, they would do that with the sinew, yeah. And so those are, those are uh, walrus hide lashings, yeah. Other question? Yeah. I, I was on the Louis Saint Laurent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Canada's biggest ice breaker camp is getting through ice more than most other countries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what Peary couldn't steam through, he blew up. Yeah. <laughs>